Hello! Welcome to Slate Money, your guide to the business and finance news of the week. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios, joined by my colleague Emily Peck. Hello, hello. And by Elizabeth Spires of the New York Times. Hello. We are going to talk about all manner of different stuff today, but we are going to start by talking about New York Community Bank Corps, which was kind of rescued by the one and only Steve Nushin this week. We're going to talk about Steve Nushin, how he's the zealot of bank crises. We are going to talk about wallets and whether we even need them anymore. We are going to talk about SEC rules about carbon emissions. We have a whole slate plus about owner's equivalent rent and inflation and what even is inflation and how much we love the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's all coming up on Slate Money. Hey there, Slate Money listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch, subject to credit approval. Terms apply. So, Emily, guess what? What? We didn't have a banking failure or banking crisis this week. We came close, though. And how I know is that Steve Mnuchin was in the news again. And is Steve Mnuchin, what did you call him, the Z-League of bank crises? He's the Z-League of bank crises. Every time there's a crisis with banks, he's there. The former U.S. (laughs) Treasury Secretary, he just shows up in the nick of time, like back in the financial crisis in 08 when he bought IndyMac. IndyMac failed and then they sold it to him and his group and then he renamed it One West because apparently the IndyMac name was tarnished. Yeah, once your bank fails, you want to get a new name for it. Absolutely. Good idea. Check. Let's just pause. We should really explain what the news is. Yeah. Elizabeth, what is the news? So earlier this week, NYCB's stock dropped precipitously from $3 and 17 cents to $1.76. And when the value of the company plummeted, Mnuchin stepped in to sort of bail it out at $2 a share. That was the Matt Levine take. And I don't think it's true. I, I think that what happened was the earlier this month, or like basically at the end of January, when New York Community released its quarterly earnings, the stock plummeted from like $10 a share to $4 a share. And then about a week ago, it plummeted again from like $4 to $3 when they said that they weren't going to get their annual report out on time because they had weaknesses in risk controls and they wanted to be sure that their remediation was working. And then Moody's downgraded them again for the second time. And then everyone was like, oh shit, this is a really bad look. And that caused the stock to fall to three dollars so there were two big pieces of bad news that caused the bank to be in a very bad place and people knew it was a bad place and that's why its stock was trading at a very low three dollars a share and it seems to me that what happened then was that Sandra Dinello, who took over as CEO and who used to be the CEO of Flagstar Bank which was bought by New York Community Bank was like, we need to raise a bunch of capital. We really, really need cash, equity. And so he goes around all of the usual suspects. I'm sure he talked to Chris Flowers. I'm sure he talked to Steve Nushin. And he he basically, and Steve Nushin basically said, well, I can put a consortium together to buy, you know, to invest like a billion dollars, but it's basically going to be a take under. I'm going to pay you $2 a share. This is exactly the move that JP Morgan did with Bear Stearns, right? Is that you inject capital at a level way below where the share price is. And the reason I think it happened that way is that when Mnuchin got on the call, he's like, oh, yeah, we actually did a whole bunch of due diligence on this. And we 
went like line by line through their commercial real estate obligations and not just looked at whatever was in the data room, but they phoned up the borrowers and they phoned up the office building owners and the single family rental owners. And they were like, tell me about what your occupancy is, what kind of rents you're getting, what kind of who's late on their rent and that kind of stuff. They did a bunch of work. This is not an amount of work that you can do between, you know, noon on Friday and 2.30 when a press release goes out, right? This is this is a, a substantial amount of diligence. I think what happened was that the Wall Street Journal got wind of the fact that New York Community Bank was talking to Mnuchin and wanted the equity. And that was the story that they put out. But they weren't completely up to speed on the idea that the deal was basically done at that point. So what happens is the journal puts out a story saying they want to raise equity and that causes the stock to plunge to like $1.75 because the worst thing you can do if you're a bank in trouble is admit that you are looking for equity. The best thing you can do is announce that you have received equity. The worst thing you can do is say, I am looking for it. And so for half an hour, it seemed as though they were looking for equity but hadn't found it. Then the stock was halted. And then a couple of hours at 12.30, and then at 2.30, the press release goes out saying, guys, I know you think we're looking for money. In fact, we have found money. In fact, we have found a billion dollars. And we have like, and, and Mnuchin is coming to the rescue. And that caused the stock to bounce way back up again. So that that's my view, is that the deal was basically done when the journal article came out and this was not an opportunistic move by Mnuchin to sort of leak the news like, like, like leak something to the wall street journal cause the share price to fall and thereby like reduce the price at which he was buying in yeah i guess i okay i buy it it's particularly since Mnuchin came in and installed joseph odding who he'd worked with at one west as the new ceo and danilo had been ceo for all of a week yeah, Danilo, Danilo was the chairman of the board. And then what happened was that the old CEO of New York Community Bank, or this guy, Kajemi, I think his name is, was in charge of the ship when it started fucking up its whole risk accounting and stuff, right? So they wind up firing their chief risk officer and their chief accounting officer. Danilo takes over as executive chairman, and I've talked about this executive chairman role on the show before that it basically means you're running the place without having quite the same amount of accountability. And then he does this call where it's pretty clear that he's running the place. And Kajemi is also on the call who continues to hold his CEO role, but basically doesn't say anything. And, and Danello is like the guy now in charge. And then a couple of weeks after that, they put out this new like SEC form saying, oh, shit, our accounting was so fucked up that we're not going to be able to get our annual report out on time. And at that point, Kajemi gets kicked out. And the only person who can take over the CEO is Dinello. But I kind of buy the idea that Dinello was not like, I want to run this bank, you know, indefinitely. My job is to rescue this place. And he rescued it by finding Mnuchin and Otting. Otting is an experienced bank CEO. He ran One West. And he's like, you want to take over? That's fine. I will let you take over. So I don't think that Danello was kicked out so much as that he brought in the new CEO. I think this story is interesting because it kind of has its roots in the banking crisis we talked about a year ago, in that New York Community Bank was a lot smaller a year ago, and then it wound up buying Signature Bank, which was one of the banks in crisis last year, and got it got bigger. Now, Ken Jemmy has blamed this, the fact that it got bigger. He says that's like the root of their problems. It got much bigger and it had to deal with tougher regulations. So that's part of the thing that happened here. There's this like artificial line in the sand at 100 billion. Right. And the FDIC, um, Emily and I received a lovely email from the FDIC saying that it, they didn't buy most of Signature Bank. They only bought like $30 billion worth of Signature Bank assets and took on all of the Signature Bank deposits. But the point was that that $30 billion or whatever it was, a signature bank they did take on, was enough to make the bank bigger than $100 billion. Once you're bigger than $100 billion, the regulators start 
really breathing down your neck and they're like you've you're 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 in the big leagues now you've got to be really you've got to have all of your eyes dotted and your tears crossed and it turns out they didn't have any of that yeah and so i wonder like the fact that they had to release uh that report saying like our risk controls are no bueno like that happened because they got bigger and like their old risk controls probably were fine enough didn't matter but now they really mattered and that helped kind of like precipitate this yeah, crisis probably their old risk controls were were terrible but they <laughs> but like the regulators weren't weren't looking hard enough to find them yeah, also two things can be true it can be true that you know they were subject to significantly higher regulatory oversight and needed higher capital requirements, but also that Cap Jimmy was just not to deal with it and didn't anticipate it. So on the one hand, you're like, that's bad. We came to the brink of some kind of crisis. But on the other hand, it's like mm, a bank got bigger. It helped avert the last crisis a year ago. It had to like, it had some growing pains, had to deal with new regulations, tougher regulations. And in the end, Steve came in like he always does. That's his MO. Save the day and all is well. And and what's more, because in between rescuing IndyMac Bank and rescuing New York Community Bank, Steve Mnuchin was Treasury Secretary, as we all know. And his friend Otting, who was the CEO of One West, he installed Otting as the controller of the currency, who's like basically one of the top bank regulators in the US. What that means is that they not only have experience turning around banks and making them better but they also have a huge amount of experience at the top levels of bank regulation so the regulators are going to be much more comfortable with them you can't you can't find the bank ceo who's more friendlier to a regulator than like a former head of the occ yeah, also adding was known during his tenure for gutting the community reinvestment act uh and or not totally gutting it but what he did was he made some changes to it so that banks could invest in different communities, but they were sort of exempt from prior law that said that they also had to offer financial services to low-income people. So what are the implications of that for him as a CEO of NYCB, or are there any? None. Like, I mean, I, I, feel, I feel like the CRA stuff is, is, is a sideshow here. Things like CRA obligation, community reinvestment obligations, are obligations on banks. They're things that banks, you know, that the, the margin reduce bank profitability and increase the amount that banks have to spend. So regulators in general don't love them. And so, uh, you know, for-profit free market guy like Otting will probably interpret CRA rules more broadly and, uh, and give banks more leeway to invest CRA funds in the places that they can make the most money from. But ultimately, there has never been a case of a bank, you know, succeeding or failing based on CRA expenditures. Like that's always marginal. And plus, the other thing is that say what you will about the how advisable it was for. New York Community Bank or to get into this business of lending huge huge amounts of money to rent control departments, but you don't get more CRA than lending to rent control departments, right? I mean, th their CRA score is going to be just fine. Well, every bank CRA score is just fine. The, <laughs> all banks do well on the Community Reinvestment Act scoring, as according to the data that I've seen reporting on the CRA. Everyone gets everyone gets an A. Everyone gets an A. Yeah, but it's like, no, it's like it's like the Fed stress tests, right? The idea is the, these are a test that you're, you're designed to pass. You're, you're, you know, the regulators on some level will kind of just like make sure that you're putting enough money to enough places that you will pass it because it's actually the easiest thing in the world to pass the CRA. I know this because I used to be on the board of a community development credit union. And the only thing you need to do if you're a bank to pass the CRA is write a check to a CDCU and put it in there as what's called a non-member deposit. And like, if you just put like a couple million dollars on deposit at the Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union, bang, you have now reinvested in your community and you're fine. So like, it, it literally takes 10 minutes to pass the CRA. It's not hard. So like, what's the takeaway? So we, we kind of like walked up to the brink of, uh, can I say this without triggering fear, a bank failure, maybe, but we didn't, we didn't get one. Um, it's a year since Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, and we had that mini banking crisis. FDIC this week uh, came out with some data that shows that there are more banks kind of in trouble right now. What 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 do I make of the banking sector right now? Is it fine? 
I, so so the, structurally speaking, the banking sector is weak right now. The, the worst thing you can have if you're a bank is high interest rates with a flat yield curve because you wind up having to pay a lot more money for deposits and you can't do the core of what banks do, which is maturity transformation. Like the, the, the idea of what a bank does is it takes in money at short-term deposits at a low interest rate and then lends them out long-term at a high interest rate. But the yield curve is flat right now, which means you can't lend out the money for a higher interest rate than you're taking it in. And that makes profits very hard to come by. So the macro environment and the rate environment is, is not good for banks. And if you look at the banking sector broadly, and especially regional banks, most of them are trading below book value, which means we can talk about that, what that means and whether book value is actually what they're worth or not. But it basically means that bank share prices are depressed. And certainly New York Community Bank's share price is depressed even after the bounce back post Mnuchin investment, it's still trading way, way below book value. Book value is like 650-ish per share, even with the massive dilution of shares that Mnuchin is doing. But yeah, they had that problem, which is you can't make money from maturity transformation and you have to pay a lot more money for deposits than you are historically comfortable paying. They also had a little, as of the past week, they began to see the beginnings of a baby bank run. They, there was not a run on the bank and they were actually lucky that most of the deposits are under the Flagstar brand and people who bank with Flagstar weren't realizing that Flagstar was in trouble because all of the headlines were about New York Community Bank. But there were, like, when the second Moody's downgrade happened, a, a chunk of their, like, uninsured deposits did leave. So there was the beginnings of a, of a bank run there. But, yeah, but the... But now they're like recapitalized. Their market cap, if you include all of the shares that Mnuchin bought, has basically gone up by $2 billion. They've been placed on review for upgrade by Moody's, and they're like a good, solid regional bank now. They're, not, they're still not worth more than book value. Banks in general, especially regional banks, are not worth more than book value. The banking sector as an industry does not look super attractive, but that's okay. Like we don't need banks to be super profitable. We don't need banks to be making lots of money for shareholders. All we really need is for banks to not fail. And right now we seem to have got through this wobble. No other bank seems to be in particular danger and the banks will survive. And that's all that like from a macro prudential point of view, that's all we need. Hooray. Steve Mnuchin will survive too. I won't say hooray for that. <laughs> Here, Nancy Wallace is depositing $5 in her savings account. She probably thinks of this only as a means of helping herself. Building up a reserve fund. Okay, so before we head to the break, I wanted to tell you guys about our Slate Plus segment this week because it's really fun. It's, it's very nerdy. We we're talking about this piece of the inflation report that Felix really hates and I'm really confused by, and we really dig into it and nerd out, yet somehow I feel like this is maybe one of our funner segments in a while. If you're not a Slate Plus member, you might want to subscribe to hear this because Slate Plus members get to hear that segment at the end of the show. And not only do they get to hear the segment, they don't hear ads on Slate Podcasts, and you get a bunch of other really great Slate stuff when you sign up for Slate Plus. You get ad-free listening, like I said, on all the podcasts, plus, plus, unlimited access to all the stories on Slate.com and a members-only newsletter. So you're going to want to sign up at Slate.com slash plus. That's Slate.com slash plus. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Let's meet our expert. Hi, I'm Ian Khan. I'm a technology futurist, speaker, and author, and I love to help organizations measure their current state of readiness for an AI-driven world. I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, our finance team is top-notch, but small. How can AI support them? Signed, Financially Drained. 
Well, financially drained, a lot is happening in finance and AI and the possibilities are endless. First of all, AI can help your finance team analyze massive amounts of financial data faster than any human or a team of people could do. Second, it can help perform functions on data through algorithms. This can connect different systems together and really simplify decision making for your finance team. And last but not least, AI can help reduce the time needed for data to provide insights so that your leaders can make faster decisions. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. When it comes to your finances, go for the credit card that's always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We're talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Let's stay in financial services and talk about wallets. Wallets are this wonderful metaphor that you seem to see everywhere. Like when people are rich, like everyone says, oh, yeah, are you feeling it in your wallet? Or like, oh, my God, like it's hurting people right where it hurts, in the wallet. And everyone has a <laughs> wallet. And the idea is that we're all walking around with a wallet, and the wallet has like foldy green banknotes in it. And then when we pay for something, we reach into our wallet, and we take out the foldy green banknotes, and we pay for the thing, and we get it back. And when was the last time you did that? I use my wallet every almost every day. But, Not with foldy green banknotes, yeah, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's really just a device that holds my one credit card that I use and then a bunch of other stuff that I'm not sure what it is, like business cards from like five years ago, <laughs> expired, you know, things that you punched with sandwiches, stuff like that. I mean, it's really a mess. You, you never know when you're going to need to know the fax number at the Huffington Post. <laughs> you don't know. You, <laughs> you don't, don't know. know. Someone might want my card. They might want to know <laughs> that I work. But yeah, so the wallets are these big, clunky, sort of atavistic things that no one quite knows what they're for, because as you say, all you really need is a credit card. And credit cards can live on your phone now. Like all my credit cards live on my phone. I tap to pay basically for everything. Um, so the idea is, at least according to the New York Times, that we don't need a wallet because you can have your credit card on your phone. And I have to admit that there have been multiple occasions that I have left the house without my wallet and I have been fine because on most days I do not use my wallet. I carry it around with me and I think to myself, well, it's there if I need it, but I don't need it. But you don't drive that because if you drive, I always make sure I have my wallet because my driver's license is in there. And on the off chance I'm pulled over, which has only happened once. I want to have my driver's license, right? You definitely need to make sure you have your driver's license on you. But now, this is the you know news hook, I guess. It's not much of a news hook, a vague news hook. Increasing number of states, I think there are like five or six states, which let you have your driver's license on your phone as well. And once you have your driver's license on your phone, at that point, you kind of really don't need a wallet. What about your health insurance card? Oh, you can have that on your phone too? <laughs> I have that on my phone. I have most of these things on my phone, but it's still, especially if you go to a lot of restaurants and there are a lot of stores that won't take Apple Pay or Google Pay or, or whatever, uh, you still kind of need a card because it's not so ubiquitous that you can do this everywhere. But just to scope out and say, talk about how popular this is, the, the stat that sort of provoked this conversation was that 80% of Gen Zers are using mobile wallets. And a lot of them have just given up old school analog physical wallets entirely. Yeah, but like the a lot is no one actually knows what that number is. And we don't know that it's a lot. Like the using mobile wallets, like that's me, right? I use mo my mobile wallet every day carrying around a physical wallet. So that's the next step. The stat is that 80% are using them in some form, which means you know 20% aren't at all. Right. But, the, but the, the, the interesting question for the purposes of this segment is once you start using your mobile wallet for functionally everything, at what point can you give up your physical wallet entirely? And I didn't see any stats about how many Gen Zers or anyone else 
had managed to give up their physical wallet entirely, but it does seem to be something that some people are doing with some degree of success. You are absolutely right that the main reasons why you still do need a physical wallet is number one, restaurants who drop a check on the table and expect you to drop a card on the check and then they walk it back to the back of the restaurant and something magical happens and it comes back and you sign it. And it's such a, yeah. Like if, if we get rid of that whole thing, I would be happy, but we are still a long way of, uh, away from getting rid of that. That's a very standard way of paying for restaurant meals. And number two is the various points at which you need to show a driver's license, which is not just when you're pulled over by a police or when you're driving the car. It's also, you know, if you're going to half at least half of the office buildings that I go to, they always oh, ask right, you for ID when you want to go in. And if you try to show them like some digital thing on a the phone, they are going to give you you know, the stink eye. And of course, when you go to the club, right, Felix? <laughs> oh, the, the, the club knows me. My, my club <laughs> knows me, Emily. I do right, not need to course. show them any ID. But what do we... Okay, so these are all the practical complications on the road to a walletless world. What do we lose when we lose our wallets? Because going cashless... We lose... The, the wallet is a chain. And we lose our chains. I don't know. I, I still... I still sort of lament the loss of like the, the move to cashless because I think it puts you at a remove from your money in a way that maybe isn't good for people like trying to adhere to budgets or anything. Once you like lose the tactile, the experience of like, I have this money in my wallet and I can see it and I can count it. I know how much exactly I have and I pay for this thing and now I have this much less. Like once you like lose touch with that, I think you're just spending money like willy nilly everywhere. And I don't think that's good. That was also an argument against credit cards, though, and, and particularly debit cards. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it really is. I remember reading a piece by Megan McCardle, of all people, many years ago, where she was like, I wanted to get a handle on my spending, and she in, and she adopted this mildly insane budgeting approach. Is it the envelopes? Which involves envelopes. <laughs> and you literally put cash in envelope. You take yeah. all your money out in cash. You put all of the cash in envelopes. And then like each envelope is, is, is earmarked for a certain kind of expenditure. And then when you've run out of money, cash in that envelope, you know, if you're, once you've run out of cash of your, I don't know, buying gas for your car envelope, you're not allowed to buy gas for your car anymore. It seems batshit to me. But like apparently it works quite well if you have the discipline to do it, which I don't think anyone does. What well, you're absolutely right that we lose the the more abstracted that money gets, the easier it becomes to spend. And to Elizabeth's point, a credit card is much more abstracted money than physical folding cash. But it is also true that just tapping a phone, like when you don't need to like sign something is kind of easier and more abstracted still the yeah, easier like the, the payments level. become the easier it becomes to spend too much i think that's yeah, yeah. And, i mean and like if you pull back even more like probably not good for individual budgeting or consumer financial health but like really great for the u.s economy like a, yeah. a move to cashless is going to drive more consumer spending and like that's great for like the big picture gdp and economic growth and all that. So it's kind of like a backdoor way to growth. It doesn't have to do with really productivity. Or maybe it does because it's more efficient. The hidden Apple Pay stimulus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I, I'd be curious what people think. Like, are, are people not using wallets anymore? I still, I, I already, I, I use a wallet. I just bought my daughter a wallet because she has, a, she's cash. She's all in cash. Oh, she, is she a cash person? She doesn't have one of those like teen credit cards where you get to control what kind of items she can buy? We haven't we haven't made that move yet. I'm I sure feel, it's coming. I feel like she, the teen I, credit cards are good because with the cash, she can spend that on anything. Whereas with yeah. the teen credit card, you have visibility into what she's buying. That's true. Hmm. My eight-year-old has a debit card and we have an account for him where his allowance goes. And he is less likely to spend with the card because then he has to ask two people for permission to do it. <laughs> if I give him cash, he's a Whoa, of, he needs double permission? He needs double buy-in for that? Like you have to unlike the keys? Yeah. It's, it's, wow. That's that that's hardcore, Elizabeth. Like you would think <laughs> you would think that one parent would be enough. But no, he needs like permission from both before he can spend anything. Just to buy a candy bar? It's not a hard rule, no. But he, <laughs> he 
usually if, if he's looking to buy something with the card, it's a bigger ticket purchase. So we'd probably make him. Is he intuitively, does he like spending money or does he like saving money? Uh, it, he sort of goes back and forth. He'll, he'll impulse buy things like Pokemon cards, but if he's got something that he wants to save for, he's not bad about putting it away. So. It's more fun to spend with cash, isn't it? Like it's, it's like you just do it and it's done and like, there's no real record of it. And it's like, you don't have to think about it a month later, you know, when you look at your credit card bill, it's over, you know? Yeah. I like cashless though. Cause I don't like walking around with a ton of ones and a bunch of change and it's just annoying. But I, I also... But for me, I, I will keep a wallet till the end of time because I lose my phone all the time <laughs> and I, I've lost my wallet like once. And so the idea of having them combined just means that I would lose my wallet more frequently if it's just entirely on my phone. <laughs> oh, that's no good. Suppose you lose your wallet on vacation. I have no cash, no, no credit cards. You have nothing. What will you do? What will you do? Are you selling a little, a lot? Shopify helps you sell basically anything. It is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from launching your online shop to opening up a real life store to, oh my God, I just hit a million orders. Shopify is there every step of the way. It will help you grow. Doesn't matter whether you're selling scented soap or outdoor outfits. They help you sell everywhere. Name the country you want to sell. They will help you sell in it. They are Canadian themselves. They understand this is a whole big world. They're not. It's not just America, people. Sell your stuff from an all-in-one e-commerce platform that even has an in-person point-of-sale system. Wherever, whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. They even now have this thing called Shopify Magic, which is an AI-powered all-star, which will help you sell even more with less effort. And they have award-winning help to support your success every step of the way sign up for a one dollar per month trial period at shopify.com slash money all lowercase go to shopify.com slash money now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in shopify.com slash money your pet is one of a kind and so is their journey while every playful moment is a memory in the making Sometimes cats and dogs are a little too good at getting into trouble. That's why you should check out ASPCA Pet Health Insurance. The ASPCA Pet Health Insurance Program offers customizable accident and illness plans, making it easier for pet parents like you to help your pet get the care they may need. The ASPCA Pet Health Insurance Program has been around for over 18 years, and they've helped more than 600,000 pets during that time. They allow you to customize your plan, helping ensure that your pet's plan is as unique as they are. Because vet bills can really add up, especially when you're least expecting it. It's simple. Use their app to submit a claim and you'll receive reimbursement for eligible vet bills directly into your bank account. To explore coverage, visit ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash slate money. That's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash slate money. Again, that's ASPCA petinsurance.com slash slate money. This is a paid advertisement. Insurance is underwritten by either Independence American Insurance Company or United States Fire Insurance Company and produced by PTZ Insurance Agency Limited. The ASPCA is not an insurer and is not engaged in the business of insurance. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. Earn up to 3% daily cash back on every purchase every day. Then grow it at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account with Apple Card. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. Terms apply. Let's move on and talk about carbon emissions, because this is a big deal. The SEC has finally promulgated its official rule saying that public companies, most public companies, certainly big public companies, need to report on their scope one and scope two carbon emissions. Basically, when they're out there emitting carbon, that's something that shareholders care about and that companies now need to report. And 
I'm like, yay, this is awesome. Would you guys agree? I think it is. I, I think bigger companies are going to knee jerk hate it because they hate any kind of additional required disclosure. Have you seen any big co- big companies oppose this? Well, I don't think they would come right out and say it, but they generally push back on additional regulation generally. I think it's good for shareholders, though, because it evaluates the sort of financial materiality of climate change impacts. And that's something that if you're a shareholder, you would absolutely want to understand. Well, no, it, I don't think it evaluates the financial materiality. Well, it requires them to report it. Yes. Yeah. It, it's just a reporting requirement. They don't need to say, like, this is a good amount of carbon to emit, or this is a bad amount of carbon to emit. You just need to report how much carbon you're emitting. A lot of companies lobbied really hard to get this thing watered down because one thing it doesn't require companies to do, I guess it's called scope three. Right. It doesn't require companies to report on admissions down the supply chain, which sounds boring. But if you think about it, that includes consumers. So like if I'm a car company, I don't, I don't have to think about the admissions that people do, people make when they're driving my cars, which is like kind of a big deal and is important. So that's, that's not in there anymore. Um, and also companies only, it's at their discretion. They only have to report this stuff if they consider it material to their financial bottom line, but it's up to the companies to decide that. Although I suppose they could be vulnerable to shareholder suits or something if they don't. I, I think, I think most people will though. I think this is going to be it, like, because it's only scope one and scope two, it's relatively easy to report. Scope three is notoriously impossible to measure. You know, some there are lots of, you know, environmental consultancy companies out there saying, hire us and we will measure your scope three emissions for a vast amount of money. But it does cost a lot of money. There's huge error bars on it. And at least in principle, like insofar as companies are dealing with other companies, you know, the one company's scope three emissions is another company's scope two or scope one emissions. And so you can kind of like all add up at some point. But yeah, I'm not, I I do think that if you want to sort of add up all of the emissions in SEC filings and get a feel for carbon emissions nationally, that's a terrible way of doing it. And this, this makes it harder to do that, but no one would do that anyway. And what's more, a lot of companies are going to be reporting their scope three emissions. This is the other thing that no one's really focusing on is that California is forcing companies to report their scope three emissions. A bunch of European regulations are forcing companies to report their scope three emissions. So if they have to do it anyway, for California and for Europe, they'll do it in their SEC filings too. Yeah. I mean, the the other thing, I mean, it's. It, I think it's good. Any movement here is good. And there's evidence that in Europe where companies are already doing this, that when they report their emissions, that their emissions go down. So, you know, if you measure it, you can fix it, change it, whatever. But it's the United States. And already, I think 11 attorneys general have filed a lawsuit seeking to stop this thing from going into effect. And considering the climate right now in the courts and where the Supreme Court is at when it comes to you know, administrative agencies and environmentalism, like, I'm not optimistic that this thing will last and make it through the court process even, you know? And, and yes, maybe companies will start doing it anyway, but I'm just not that optimistic right now in the US. Like, companies have been pulling back from ESG, environmentalism, social governance, especially the environmentalist stuff, because they're afraid of being called woke and all this. They pulled out of some other like initiative called climate action or something. Um, They've taken language out of reports. They're just like very afraid to do this stuff right now. And the climate just seems the, the climate, the vibes. Well, the states that are suing skew a little bit redder and they also have heavier industrial bases. So, so, I mean, this is something we have been talking about over in the Axios side of things quite a lot, Emily. It's like, are the companies actually pulling back from ESG and DEI stuff, or are they doing just as much ESG and DEI, DEI stuff as ever and just talking about it less and being less like shouty from the rooftops and, and saying like, this used to be something that would give us a good reputation so we would get our marketing function to amplify all of the stuff that we're doing. Now it gives us a bad reputation so our marketing function has like shut the fuck up but we're still doing it um i think it's it's a little like we're still doing it but there are companies that are doing less stuff or like to broaden it out since you brought it up on dei like 
they're opening up programs that were once targeted towards, say, like Black women inside companies are now targeted towards everyone. And on the ESG, on the E side, you know, they're, they are pulling out of certain initiatives, voluntary initiatives. So there is pullback. It's not just a pullback in rhetoric and marketing. It's like a real pullback. Should we have a numbers round? Elizabeth, what's your number? My number is 217, and that's the number of COVID boosters a 62-year-old man in Germany got over the course of 29 months. Oh, I love this what? story. What? <laughs> <laughs> A study in The Lancet indicates that he had no side effects. So for people who are worried that you can get overboosted in some way, it it makes a difference. And And, and they actually found like the 214th boost. Yeah, Every extra COVID booster he got actually did improve his immune response a little bit better. And they they were all helpful. All of them helped, at least a little bit. They asked him why he did it. And he said, for private reasons. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, what a hero. My number, I, I'm going to do a really nerdy number, which is 200 billion, which is the number of euros in pools of loans that mostly European banks have offloaded in this wonderful thing called a CRT or an SCRT, uh, which stands for Synthetic Credit Risk Transfer. And this is the other way to rescue a bank if the minooch is not around coming in with a billion dollars to save the day one of the ways that european banks especially and also uk banks to a large degree are being able to persuade regulators that their loan books aren't as risky as they thought is by basically taking all of the risk of that of those loan books and selling that risk to outside investors to private equity to hedge funds to insurance companies that kind of stuff and once you do that the regulators are like oh you're right you've you sold off all the risk someone else will take the loss if there's a loss so you know your capital ratios have improved and this is something that like if you're a bank in the u.s wanting to sort of optimize things and prevent yourself from falling into trouble would be great but the fed seems to be of two minds about whether they love it or not and that seems to be and and i know that new york community bank was reported to have been looking at this but couldn't really get the regulators on board but i think it'll i i suspect it's going to wind up happening in the u.s as well and then that number is going to be even bigger once the american banks start getting into it like right now is there's been like four or five american banks mostly doing like auto loan portfolios so like eh, auto loans that's not a important customer relationship you know we can sell that we can sell off that risk and improve our and free up some capital but i think it might become bigger so like you heard it here first crt credit risk transfers might be happening (laughs) not the other crt (laughs) not not critical race theory no you're taking back CRT. Exactly. <laughs> We're reclaiming it know. for nerds to, you know, really. Well, to be fair, the original critical race theory was extremely nerdy. Super wonky. It is still yes. nerdy. Yeah. It's, we should just leave yeah. anything CRT to the nerd. <laughs> exactly. Emily, what's your number? My number, it's not nerdy. It's one. And that is the number of hours we lose this weekend. Oh. I'm not mad about it. <laughs> Set your clocks ahead. Yeah, people. we get sunlight now. We get sunlight now and we lose an hour of sleep. And, you know, it's a hotly debated thing. People don't like this. People do like this. I I think I land on the I don't like it because I don't like losing an hour of sleep. Um, and the days get longer anyway. You know, it's fine. Like we will have longer days even if we didn't do this to our clocks and our bodies. And, you know, a lot of bad stuff can happen. The bad stuff is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly a function of the clocks changing. Lots of bad stuff happens when they go forward. Lots of bad, st- bad stuff happens when they go back. Clocks should never change. We they should, should have, never change. We should have one fucking time zone and stick to it. The, Not the, literally one time zone. Well, I mean, one time <laughs> zone per time zone. Okay. <laughs> The big debate is if we only have one, and almost everyone agrees that one is better than two, but there's a massive cleavage between the people who are like, the winter time zone is the one that we should have year round, and the people who say the summer time zone is the one that we should have year round. And I am saying, my point of view is very strongly that we are moving into the promised land of 
much, much better time zone. And the new time zone that we have, the the summertime time zone, is the one that, that we should have year round. Daylight savings forever. Daylight savings say. forever. <laughs> and like, let's not have it get dark at 3.30 in the afternoon anymore. That's horrible. That is horrible. I agree. But I don't think I care. Just pick one. I'm okay with either. <laughs> but stop changing it. No one likes it, especially parents of young kids. I remember that because little babies, they don't know about times changing. It, it's hard to deal with that. Let's just get rid of it all. Let's start Let's start it here and make it nationwide. I mean, I know there's a lot of action. There was some legislation last year that went nowhere. But yeah, sleep in on Sunday. And you know what? As the host of Slate Money, I am giving you all, lovely Slate Money listeners, special dispensation to sleep in on Monday as well. You just, just sleep in on Monday. And if anyone asks where you were, just say, I was sleeping in because the clock's changed. Felix will write your boss a note. I will write your boss a note, yeah. I think that's it for us this week. Thank you for writing in. The email address, as ever, is slatemoney at slate.com. Thank you to Jared Downing and Shana Roth for producing. And thank you for all of the lovely notes you sent me about the Gary Stevenson interview that came out on Tuesday. People really like that. And guess what? Normally, Money Talks comes out every other Tuesday, but because we have so many amazing Money Talks, we have... A new one coming out this Tuesday. Emily, who's coming on? Chloe DeMond, the director of Fair Play, which is this amazing movie on Netflix that everyone should watch before they listen. And then you can you can find out more about it on Tuesday. It's one of the best explorations, I think, of gender dynamics in the workplace. And that sounds dry, but this thing is, it's like a sexual, it's basically like a sexual thriller, kind of 90s throwback in that way. All right. So Chloe DeMond is coming on Tuesday. And then after that, We'll be back with the regular Slate Money on Saturday. When it comes to your finances, go for the credit card that's always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We're talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card.